Good morning, church. So great to see everybody's actual faces here and not just your eyeballs today. Amen. Great. Well, hey, why don't we all stand together and thank God for bringing us to where we are today. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me.
right, good morning, church family. Hey, have a seat for just a moment as uh, me and my friend here, we talk to you. Welcome, welcome friends, welcome families, uh, welcome individuals, welcome young people. What a joy it is to be able to gather together and to be able to see each other face to face. I'm Pastor Gordon, and here's one of my friends. Hi, my name is Ian, I'm in the second grade. I love Beyblades. If you're new here, let us know at myclc.info. What is going on in the, in the front yard? What's going on in the front yard? That's a great question. We got some exciting things happening out in the front yard. You saw a little uh, area where some landscaping has been removed. There's a little uh, stamped patio out there. Next week, June 13th, we're going to have a front lawn service at both 9 and 11 o'clock. So bring your chairs, bring some blankets, and we're going to talk about the patio out there, and we're going to dedicate it to our community. What's all the boxes around the church building? All the boxes. You got some great questions. Who hit that? He got, he got good questions. If you look around the building, you may not have noticed them, uh, but there's a lot of little boxes, right? They're almost like big little boxes, aren't they? And they, they say ductless system. So what that is, is that we as a church family have come together uh, with resources and prayer and God's blessing, and we are in uh, the beginning stages of completely upgrading and overhauling the entire building and the heating and the cooling system. Let's just honor God for that, right? Through our obedience as a family, we only had to borrow half half of what we needed for the project. That right there is a huge, huge thing. So in part for next week's outdoor service, um, they're going to be working on this, well, really the, the, the roof area right there. And so they put the units on the roof uh, this week. There's a big crane out there, super cool thing. And after this service, we're actually going to be removing these pews and putting them in the lobby because they're going to have scaffolding here and they're going to be working on this area in here. And when we come back together and then after a couple weeks, the building will be balanced. Because you may, come on, let's celebrate that, good. You may not realize this, but as we are comfortable in this room, our children's spaces are not so comfortable all the time. Sometimes it's super cold, and sometimes it's super hot, and I'm not okay with that. And so we're going to make the building balanced for everybody to be able to use it, whether it's on the top floor, the lower level, or the main floor. So let's just praise God for that opportunity. Hey, during this uh, next song, we have an opportunity to continue our obedience and our giving. We share the resources that God has given so graciously to us. During this next song, you can come forward and place your offering in the baskets. You can give online. Hey, we didn't say hi to the people online. Can we do that? Hello, people online. Hello. And so you guys can give online. That's a great way because you're not here, so you can't give in person. But we look forward to seeing you in person as soon as you're able to come in. You, well, I like to do text to give. Uh, that's our new heating and uh, cooling system. And I can explain more to you afterwards, okay? You're good, you're good. And so let's give together, let's stand, let's worship, and let's honor God.
bow your heads in prayer with me. Father God, you are our way maker. We thank you and praise you for your goodness and faithfulness to us. We thank you for bringing us through the trial of the last year and for bringing us together again. Lord, help us to always keep our eyes on you with our ears listening for your voice in the midst of the storms of life. Remind us always that when life seems to be completely out of control, that you have your hands firmly on the wheel and that we can trust you to get us to where you want us. Bless our pastor as he brings your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Since we don't have a stainless steel sports car from 1982, and phone booths are far and few between, I came up with, well, this. Over here we've got the infamous flux capacitor, but this is a 21st century model, so it's super slim. But why? So think about this. What if we could travel through time and like stop yourself from saying something you didn't actually mean? Or like, see where you're gonna be in 10 years. Or or like, even witness your favorite moment in history firsthand. Or like, we could actually do something practical, like go back and set innocent people free. Or like, rebuild what has been destroyed. Man, that'd be so cool. So the question is, when do we do I know. question is, when are we? Even better question is, uh, how do we get back? So today we begin a brand new series we're calling Back to the Future. And of course, you can see where, uh, you know, there's some play on words there with the movie and stuff like that. We are not going to talk about the movie. Uh, we are not going to talk about those things, but we are going to do some level of travel through time when it comes to seeing how the Bible supports itself and seeing how Jesus used passages from the Old Testament, uh, which really wasn't the Old Testament at that time, uh, but he used it, brought it to the present day, and we're going to kind of do a trip here together. In the next four weeks, we're going to discover that Jesus' mission was to set people free, rebuild what has been destroyed, and to have us join him on the mission in part by doing justice and remembering God in and all that he has done. Now, it's interesting. For as long as I could imagine, um, and way before me, there, the phrase is, uh, if, if only I would have known, if I, if I knew then, what I know now, right? And what does that have to do with? Has to do with time travel. It has to do with, I wish I could go back and I could tell my younger self, um, hey, don't do that. Hey, don't buy that. Don't invest in that. Don't spend time with that person. If only I could go back and be able to change something, or invest in something, or man, if we would have known Amazon was going to be a big deal, I think a lot of us would have bought more Amazon stock, right? Does anybody have that, by the way? Never mind, it's not a big deal. 
So time travel is something that if you're kind of a geek like me, uh, you're so fascinated by this idea. 1960, they put together a movie called The Time Machine. You may have seen this. Um, it's uh, this, this image right there. Uh, and then there's the time machine. There's the actor, right? And he would get into this time machine. And oftentimes people wanted to see what was going on. They, maybe they wanted to go back in time, or maybe they wanted to go to the future and see kind of what was going on. Of course, we have the trilogy uh, from the 80s that the, started in 1985, Back to the Future, which everybody knows all about, the DeLorean. I happen to have a mini version right here. Um, it, it doesn't work. I tried, uh, so I guess uh, if you can fit into it, but it's kind of a cool thing. They actually have three different models of these. You have uh, part one, part two, and part three. So stay with me for a minute if you're not interested in this. Okay, so this is part two. You can tell that because the wheels bend and it can actually fly. Not really. I tossed it and it does not fly. Um, but it does have the cool feature of the doors opening and you're like, whoa, that's just like the real DeLorean. But what's really neat is that just like when it went through time, it lights up. <laughs> right? If only we had something like this. Time travel is such a fascinating concept to so many people. Uh, continuing on to like a newer movie, uh, Beauty and the Beast did like a remake, a live action version, and in the live action, they added an element that, that wasn't in the animated series or the animated movie. So if you have not seen the movie, hey, you've had time. And so in this uh, movie, they actually, uh, the Beast, the Prince, was given a book where he can actually go and visit different parts of, of time. And of course, Belle wanted to go back to the origin of where she was, where it all kind of started, where they lived. Lived, and she got to have some more insight. We got to have more insight to the characters because we were able to go back in time. Now, uh, for those uh, Marvel Studio nerds, uh, you might be like me in this. Uh, this is an image of, uh, in, uh, this is actually uh, Infinity War, uh, the second to last installment, if you will, of all 23 movies that made up the original I don't know that I'm saying that right, but I'm sure Ryan will correct me later. This here is Doctor Strange, and he was and he was given the responsibility to guard the Time Stone, this green emblem here, this little gem, with his life, because this is the power of being able to manipulate time and go around in different areas of time. But he still was not God, because God holds time. Um, he had to travel through time. What a fascinating idea to think that, man, what would that be like? Well, let me ask you this. If you had that first time machine, maybe you had one of these. Of course, we know today it would be a Tesla. It would not be a DeLorean. <laughs> and so, so if you had a time machine, if you had a time stone, if you had the capacity to be able to go back in time, what would you bring into the future? What person, what concept, what idea, what maybe thing would you, would you bring? I think it would be so fascinating in its simplest form, um, if you think about just our community here in Mogador, uh, as, I'm, as I run down 532 early in the mornings, I always pass the giant rock that's out here that's a dedication to the founder of Mogador, uh, Ariel Bradley. Now, of course, it was actually originally known as Bradleyville, and then the name changed uh, shortly thereafter to Mogador, actually being a foreign word that means beauty or beautiful. And so I thought, I wonder what it would be like to go back in time to 1806 or a little bit later where he's kind of established here and bring him into the future and say, hey, uh, this is uh, what used to be Bradleyville. This is Mogador. What do you think? What do you think? I think it'd be so fascinating to bring people into the future to say, hey, what do you, so that they can get their reactions. Because I think some people would be like, wow. And other people would be like, why? You know, like there's all these questions and thoughts. So rhetorically speaking, what would you go back? And do who would you go back and see in the first movie of back to the future i've watched it way too many times that i care to admit that uh, marty mcfly goes back in, in time 1955 where he actually interacts with his mom and dad and of course it causes chaos and he has to fix it but the idea the concept is fascinating to me to be able to go back in time and interact with my dad or my mom before they even met now, if you, don't, if you don't like your parents and you think that you're going to keep them from, <laughs> not a good idea, because then there's no you. And so don't do that. But if we were able to go back and just have conversations, maybe we would have better insight to our parents, better insights to things that we experience even today. You ever see an old photo of somebody and you go, wow, you've really uh, 
changed a bit, <laughs> a little bit there. It doesn't even barely look like the person. Just because it's almost like, I wonder if the personality would be different, the confidence would be different. I don't know. But to be able to interact, gain wisdom. Listen, the past is filled with people, things, and ideas that we love to remember. We love to remember. That's why we celebrate things. That's why we, my, my, my wife, our family, we love scrapbooks. She's always putting together a scrapbook of what happened. And uh, one year, um, I don't know if we have a two for, do we have a two for COVID? We, we, have, we have a COVID scrapbook. That's, um, I don't know. <laughs> we should burn that. I'm just kidding. And so we do have one year where it was a big year um, where, uh, you know, we, we had uh, Brooklyn's adoption in there. And so we had the first half where it was the four of us and then the second half where she was on the cover. Look, there's you. And so it was exciting to be able to see those scrapbooks. So we remember the things that have happened. Things in the past are filled with people, things, and ideas that we wish were still around. When I think of people that I wish were still around, um, I'm a pretty simple person. I think of somebody like Robin Williams, somebody that I wish I could go back in time and if there was any way I could find him and any way I could talk with him or anything I could sit down and have coffee and just tell him there's hope. There's possibility. And just to encourage them. You know, I'm such a big movie buff. I miss John Candy. The Great Outdoors. Yeah. Right? Yeah, come on. Now, I, lo I love the movies, um, the summer rental. Like, anything with John Candy was, was just one of my Uncle Buck. Yeah. You know? that's I strive to be Uncle Buck. And so my nieces and my nephew know when I show up, something's going to go, something's going to happen. I don't know. And so it's just fascinating to think back to that, but to be able to go back and be some sort of encouragement. I think he passed away from a heart attack. I don't know what I could do, but I just have that opportunity to do that. Maybe something's much more profound in your world than mine. The past is filled with people, things, and ideas that have impacted the world in big ways. Maybe you would go back and warn um, Hawaii of Pearl Harbor. Maybe you would go back and try to I intercede for the assassination of JFK. Maybe you would try to warn people or change things for 9-11. Um, I don't know what your thing is to do. Maybe you would try to find the source, once we figure out the source, if we ever do find the source, of COVID-19 to be able to stop it right there where it was. I don't know what that is for you. But imagine the possibilities if you could. If you could, what would you do? There are, there are still relevant things today no matter how old the thing is. And that has to do a lot with Scripture. We're going to read today where Jesus in his present day pulled something from seven to 800 years before him in order to declare who he was and that he was ready to begin his mission. We're going to jump into John chapter 1 here in just a minute. So you can open your Bibles or, or, or turn on your mobile devices to uh, John chapter 1. And then we're going to kind of jump a little bit uh, back be, be, before that to Luke chapter 4. So John chapter 1 and Luke chapter 4 as we begin to understand and see how Jesus uh, used Scripture to support where he is and to establish who he was. Back in 2014, I um, had the unfortunate experience of my father passing away. And ironically enough, uh, it was a very, it was complicated relationship to say the least. And uh, ironically enough, I had a lot more grieving, uh, mourning than I anticipated, right? Not because I didn't like him, he's my, he's my birth dad, uh, but, but I did find myself uh, that heaviness that I didn't expect. And so after the funeral, which was its own dynamic in and of itself because of the relational ch uh, challenges within the family, um, I, I, I had told my wife that I was going to go over to the church, which was on Killian Road at the time. We were with Cornerstone, and there was a prayer room, and I, want, and I wanted to go into that prayer room. That's just where I felt that I was led to go sit down. And I said, Lord, give me something in your word that is going to empower me, that is going to challenge me, that is going to help me. He says, you got it. I th I'm, I'm kind of expounding myself, um, just the way the Lord speaks to me. And he says, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. 
Well, that sounds familiar, Lord. I'm going to read it. I'm going to look at it. And it says, my grace is sufficient for you. Oh, Lord, that's a really, really good, that's a really, really good uh, verse. Um, I, I know that verse. I use that verse, and it works for other people. But, but, but I want something else. I want something new. I want something fresh. I want something updated. And so he's, okay, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. Hold on, Ooh, okay, are, are we in the same conversation here? Because I want, I, I get that, I read that, like, totally, but I'm looking for something else. Okay, Gordon, how about you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. And then he says to me, um, in the way that my Heavenly Father speaks to me, right, just read it, <laughs> that moment, that moment of, right? And, um, and so I opened up my Bible and I said, fine, right, like a little chub, fine. And I started reading it, and it overwhelmed me with the truth that was written back in 56 to 57 AD, almost 2,000 years ago that this passage was written. And it was so applicable and so up-to-date and so necessary for me. You see, the Apostle Paul had just prayed three times over, over time or maybe back-to-back -back and said, Lord, take this thorn from me. His thorn could have been physical, mental, emotional. We don't know exactly what it was. There's a lot of speculation. But, we, but there was a thorn in his side somehow. He was just grieved by this thing. And he says, will you take this from me? And God did it. He did not actually remove the thorn that Paul wanted removed. And so, he says, I have learned, I have learned that your grace is sufficient for me. Jesus says, my grace, like that's all you need. It is sufficient. It is enough. It is what you need. And so something that was written so long ago that the Apostle Paul did not have me in mind, but God did, because the God that actually inspired the Scripture was with Paul and is with me now. He's still there, and he's still in the New Jerusalem. Like, he's there. He's just always there. And so this God holds time. He doesn't have to go through time. He's doing what only he can do. So today's sermon title is simply the mission. What did Jesus come to do? What were people hoping for? What does this all look like? And how, what am I, as a believer in Christ, as a follower, supposed to do about it? Well, in order for us to be able to dive into what Jesus said, we need to understand uh, an essential element of who Christ is. And it's found in John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And so I read this passage and I like to ask God questions because um, I, just, I just love the, I, I love the conversations. God, um, it would have been so much more helpful if you would have just said Jesus <laughs> instead of this whole like, in the beginning was the Word, which means Jesus. Why did you say that? Like, why is it like this? And God is very intentional. He's very purposeful with his language and with his words or however he does it. And the word here means message. And so I'm going, okay, God, I get the message part, but it still doesn't. You see, Jesus is the good news. Jesus is the word. Jesus is, in fact, who he says he is, right? And so Jesus is the word. So the establishment of that, that, that big word right there, word, somebody say word. Word. Word already existed, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so there's this message, this establishment of the message that is actually coming to the world that people have been waiting on for many, many years. And so we jump into, we jump into more time travel. Check this out. All over the world, there are images of Jesus painted on the ceilings of churches. One remarkable collection of these images is in the Church of the Savior on Spilled Blood in St. Petersburg, Russia. This image right here you'll see is standing in, uh, or imagine if you will, standing in the church of a 7,500 square meters, which is equal to 24,000 square feet of intricately detailed mosaics, the most mosaics of any church in the world. 
those tiles tell stories of some of the most important biblical scenes and figures. If you walk to the corners of the church and look up into the domes, you'll see the artist's rendering of Jesus during different stages of his life. You'll see him as an infant. You'll time travel into him as a teenage boy, a man, and as a savior. We may not be able to time travel and actually get into a car or some sort of a device that transports us physically there or even as a hologram, but we can look and we can remember, and that is in and of itself a way to travel through time and see what Jesus is doing. And so these images actually give us insight, and these words give us insight to who Jesus actually is. When God told Moses, hey, I am, it's not a was or a will be, I am. That's his name, I am. He always is. And so even in our language, it's interesting. You should try this sometime. Pay attention to how many times you say, well, that's how Jesus was. Right? We think about his physical form, don't we? And so we would say things like, oh, that's how my uncle was, or that's how my brother, things like that. But if we change our language a little bit, and it'll be a little bit annoying because you're like, oh, I keep forgetting to think of Jesus in the, in the presence, in the present constantly rather than the past. Now, if you're familiar at all with uh, the story of Jesus, you know, we start with uh, the Christmas story. We celebrate it every December. And then it jumps into the, um, uh, in scripture, into the time where Jesus was a child, probably um, you know, th this boyhood time of about 12 years old where he's in the, in the temple and he's teaching. This was the time when Mary and Joseph tried to go back home and they were like, where's Jesus? <laughs> they lost the Messiah. And so, and so they, they went back. They went a day and a half away. Of course, they were traveling with a large group of people. So maybe they just figured that Jesus was hanging out with somebody else. And so they went back and Jesus makes a very, very important statement. He says, woman, which was a respectful term in those days. Do not say that today, uh, kids, to your mom. Woman, uh-uh, not going to fly. And so, woman, wouldn't you know that I'm supposed to be about my father's business? Whoa, that's an insight because Joseph wasn't the one that was teaching in the temple or the tabernacle or the synagogues or anything like that. And so he established that. Then it jumps forward uh, to where Jesus is in his 30s, and that's when we begin to see his ministry becoming established. Now we're going to jump to Luke chapter 4 here, and we're going to read some of this here as we understand how Jesus... It's, pop, it's not popping on the scene. That was very intentional. I don't want to make it seem like it's random in any way, shape, or form. But Jesus is there 30 years, and then finally it is time for him to declare who he is. And so many people would sit down to start writing their own speeches. Well, what am I going to say? What is relevant for today? What's in our community? What's in our culture? All those types of things. But, but he goes into the synagogue, and here's, here's kind of how things lay out here. Now, like, i got to give you a little uh, brief back history to this. Jesus just about came out of the wilderness where he was tempted for 40 days. Did not sin. That just it should be an encouragement to you to know that when you're tempted, um, you're not sin. You're not sinning. It's when you give in to that temptation that is the issue. That's the problem. Now, Jesus was tempted for 40, if you read the scriptures, it wasn't just a brief, hey, Jesus, do this, hey, Jesus, do this, hey, Jesus, do this, and he was like, nope, nope, nope. Um, it was the whole time he was there, there was an element of temptation that was trying to overwhelm him. And so he comes out of that, already filled with the Spirit of God, and, and here's, here's where we pick up in Luke chapter 4, verse 14. Then Jesus returned to Galilee, filled with the Holy Spirit's power, Reports about him spread quickly through the whole region. He taught regularly in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. So he's starting to establish what's going on. And here we actually have an account where he's in his hometown in verse 16. When he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, which, it will be, which is significant, and I'll explain that in a minute, his boyhood home, he, was, uh, he went as usual, as he's been doing, to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. Now, I guess it would have been similar to this, but for the most part, they would simply read the scriptures. We have people like uh, me who expand on it and try to explain it more and more, where many people would do uh, far more studying and understanding of the scripture then than we do now. Uh, we put too much pressure on the pastor. 
<laughs> was that awkward for you? <laughs> it wasn't for me. <laughs> okay, good. So uh, Luke chapter 4, and then we begin reading here and um, continue reading in 17. So the scroll, so Jesus walks forward because there was a, a, a place where they would lay out the scroll. I mean, the scroll was much bigger than this little uh, goofy thing here. And so they just kind of laid it out on this big platform, if you will. The scroll of Isaiah, the prophet, was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. Now, it's possible that he went out of order, if you will, where he, they, he was handed the scroll, and then he starts going, no, nope, I'm not going to start there, which would have definitely made people feel a little uncomfortable because he wasn't going along with what everybody else was doing. And he starts reading a passage here, and he says this, now the people that were listening to him would have understood very, very quickly what he was reading about. He would have understood, they would have understood immediately because they studied the scripture. They knew the scripture. And so they're going, wait a second, what's he talking about? Okay, so here's what he says. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Right there, they're going, wait a second, he's reading Isaiah. Yeah, he's reading Isaiah. He's talking about the Messiah. He's talking about the Messiah, to uh, the anointed to bring good news to the poor. Now, this poor could be financially poor, but also, let's not forget, spiritually poor, those who are dead, spiritually dead, which is everybody that's born. And so we need to be focused on, yes, do we need to take care of the poor? Absolutely. We're called to do that. We're also called to take care of those who are spiritually poor. Look at Matthew, the tax collector, super rich guy, really spiritually poor. He has sent me, Jesus is reading here continually, he has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that word released, uh, that the blind will will see, and that the oppressed will be set free. That phrase set free and released are the same word in the original language that just open the doors. You're out. You're out. And that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He rolled up the scroll handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. All the eyes, picture this, all the eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. So when you look at someone intently, you don't do this. You're staring right at them. Because something's happening inside these people they're not really sure about. And then Jesus says, the scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. What's Jesus saying? That right there, that whole thing that we just read from Isaiah that was actually written seven, eight hundred years ago? Um, it's me. And something weird happens inside the people. They had been waiting, praying, researching, studying for the Messiah, couldn't wait for the Messiah to come. The Messiah shows up and they go, that was their reaction. How do I know that? Because later in the verses we read that they said, wait a second, right? Boyhood home. Isn't this the son of a carpenter? How are, hold on, time out. That that doesn't seem like that's right. I don't think that should happen. And then we read that Jesus was only able to do a couple few miracles in that area, in his hometown, because people had such little faith. And yet Jesus did what he does. Hey, I just want you to know it's me. I know you didn't see this coming. I know you knew me since I was little. I know you've known me for a long time, but I'm telling you now, this has been fulfilled. It's actually me. Makes this big announcement. He takes scripture from years ago, hundreds of years, pulls it into his present day. And kind of like this time travel moment. Yes, it was written 800 years ago but it was established today. Like, wait, what? Yeah, still very fully relevant. And they begin to see, oh my gosh, what is happening here? This could be. Maybe he is. Well, what was Isaiah declaring? Here's three things that Isaiah was declaring and Jesus was saying through these. Number one, God's people need to be saved from themselves. Basically, they need to be saved from their own unrighteousness. You know as well as I do, we can be our worst enemy. 
as believers in Christ, we actually have a choice now to sin or not sin because we are in Christ, Romans 6 and 7. And so we have the opportunity. So when you sin, you got to keep in mind, ah, you chose that. Don't blame the devil. The devil made me do it. Well, actually, no. Probably gave you an opportunity, gave you, a, gave you an insight. Oh, you could do that. And then maybe you took that. I don't know. But God's people need to be saved from themselves. The second thing is the oppressed need to be saved from their oppressors. Okay, what does that mean? How about this? The bullied need to be saved from their bullies. The oppressed, those that are pushed down and made lower, need to be rescued from those who are pushing them down. And the third thing is that God has a plan to make wrong things right. So let's watch Scripture support itself here. We're going to go back to Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, and see what Isaiah uh, was given from the Lord. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. These were words, futuristically speaking, that the Messiah would say. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me. Can you believe this is being written 800 years before it's actually spoken by the Messiah? To bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted, to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come. This is what the Messiah is going to say the day of God's anger against their enemies has come and Jesus stands up and says hey it's me it's me so Isaiah says God's people need to be saved from themselves Jesus has established that he says this is the way I know the way to do this the second thing is the oppressed need to be saved from their oppressors Jesus says I agree we're going to do something about that And the third thing, God has a plan to make the wrong things right. And Jesus says this, I know I may not look like you thought I should, or I've been born where you think I should. Maybe this may not have been what you thought, but that's part of the problem, is that you think too much. I don't know if Jesus said that. I'm just going to throw it in there, not to put it in his mouth. But I know I would have if I was him. We do think, we overthink it. I spent time with a guy uh, about a week or two ago, and he asked me all these questions, and the only thing that I could say is, why? 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 Like, I get questions, but these questions were so like, you know, the gospel is actually quite simple, but we get so overthinking it, right? We get so overthinking it that we come up with all kinds of stuff, which goes back to us being, needing to be saved from ourselves. But Jesus says, listen, the way is right here. I am the way. It's taken a long time. But the Messiah has finally come. Our Creator had a mission to restore what had been broken. He had, a, he had a mission from the very beginning. Don't think for a second that Jesus was late to the party or late to the scene. He knew, God knows exactly what He's doing every single minute, even when you don't feel it, even when you don't see it. He's working in the lives of people. I talk to people all the time and they say, oh, it must have been a God thing. And I say, I guarantee you it was a God thing because He actually has full control and full dominion over everything. Don't think for a second it was an accident. God knows what He's doing. What should that do for you, believer? That should excite you. That should excite you to know, well, if my heavenly father either established this or allowed this or pushed, whatever he did, I'm just going to trust that my heavenly father is doing what only he can do. You see, Jesus' mission, God's mission, is our mission, believer. And if Jesus has set you free, his mission becomes your mission. People can be so frustrated over trying to come up with plans and agendas and then asking God to bless the plan and agenda. And maybe God's not even doing that. How do I know that happens? Well, because eventually we're told in Scripture, futuristically speaking, that there will be people that will stand before Christ and they will say, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not uh, feed people in your name? Did I not clothe people in your name? Did I not? And Jesus says, "Uh, I never knew you. I never knew you. And so what is Jesus up to? Every week, our team, our dream team here, the staff, um, talks about a very simple concept. 
um, if the Lord allows, is how we lead. If the Lord allows, we're going to do these things. But we also say, God, what are you up to? What are you up to that we simply need to jump on board with? Because if God is already doing a work in people, doing a work in a community, why try to start something new to say, Lord, we appreciate what you're doing, but we want to do a thing. Find out what he's doing and jump on board. Let's have a moment here. We're going to do something called a justice jump. Check this out. This is going to be a really cool thing. Imagine, if you will, that I gave you a super cool fly car like this, and it was a time machine that you jumped in, and you were able to go one time to ensure something by time traveling. What would you ensure? I'm going to give you a list of a couple things just to start getting those brain juices flowing here, but would you want to ensure all families have safe drinking water globally? Would you want to ensure that all kids everywhere can go to school? I know some kids are saying, I'll make sure they don't have to go to school, right? But in some places, they don't get to go to school because they don't have it available or there's a TV show we found, a series called The Most Dangerous Ways to School. And some kids travel two hours in the morning over like a lake, mud, like all kinds of crazy stuff to get to school. And my, my kids were like, well, I guess I wouldn't go then because I'm not doing that. But they know the only way out of their situation is through education. People's bodies are protected. Would you ensure that people's bodies are protected and not sold? Would you want to use your one trip to ensure that families have enough food to eat? Would you want to ensure that people are no longer endangered or discriminated against because of their faith? What would you use your one trip for? Would you ensure that refugees are safely relocated to new communities? Would you ensure systems of racism are lamented? And transformed. We remember that word from last month as we learned about lamenting. Would you ensure that pop, uh, pollution is eradicated? Would you be able to go back to a time that everything kind of got started a certain direction and say, hey, that's not going to be good for our earth? Would you ensure that abandoned kids are reunited with families? Would you ensure that people are able to overcome their addictions? Perhaps maybe going back to that time where they first said, well, one time couldn't hurt. And to be able to actually say, yeah, I can, yeah. Probably do whatever you could to kind of stop that, wouldn't you? Would you ensure that people, have, uh, people who have never heard the good news or the gospel of Jesus in their language, the language will finally get a chance? What would you use that one trip to do? Now listen, you don't need to wait on a community life church to come up with some sort of concept that you can jump on board. You know the same spirit that, li that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, believer. And so that same spirit communicates with your spirit. If you're, sen if you're sensitive, you're listening to what the spirit is actually saying, that you actually can do amazing, great things that God has already given you a gift to perform. Everybody in the church, that's why it's called the body of Christ because everybody has a role. Within our church family, everybody needs to have a role. Everybody needs to have a role. Everybody needs to have a role. Our board of directors, everybody's busy. Why? Because nobody sits on the sideline. Nobody's just hanging out kind of waiting for things to happen. Everybody gets involved because that's what a family does. That's how the body operates. You have a gift that I do not have. It is ridiculous that people would come and just listen to my gift when you don't experience your own gift. Imagine what God wants to do in and through you. And he's already working on you. You don't need a list of things for me to tell you. He's already told you time and time again, hey, you should try this. You should do this. You should do that. Some of it could be something as simple as writing a letter to somebody you hope you never see again. 
How about, how about reaching out to somebody? How about uh, donating something? I don't know. God has worked on you, and we have fought over that so many times, haven't we? God, I don't think you understand my situation. God, I don't think that's going to work. God, 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 God. And so, and so you need to be sensitive to what that is in your life. So what's the big idea? It's simple. Jesus' mission was to set people free. How are you going to be the church in order to set people free? All those things I listed has something to do with setting people free. Free from thirst, free from hunger, free from their own unrighteousness, free from all kinds of things. How do we do that? Well, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. You don't just have a big event and beg people to come to church. <laughs> you actually uh, go and be the church because Scripture says, hey, how are they going to know you? They're going to know you, are my followers, Jesus says, by how you love each other, how you care for one another. People should look at the church and they should say, I want to be a part of that because they care for people like I've never seen. And I've seen it happening here. You know, uh, a couple weeks ago, we had a little situation with my buddy, Ken, and I have gotten, we've gotten so many texts, so many, so many calls that say, hey, how is he? Hey, how's he doing? Hey, is there anything we can do? And he was good, but everybody was like, what can we do? What can we do? And they all, we all came around to be a support. That's what the church does. But you need to understand that you have a role. Stop waiting for someone else to start something and you start it. People say, hey, I got a great idea. What do you think of it? I go, I think that's a wonderful idea. You ready to lead it? And they say, um, I don't want to lead it. Um, I thought maybe you'd do it. <laughs> yeah, no. So um, I'm already doing what God's called me to do. But if God's calling you to do a thing, then maybe you should step up and make that happen. Use your gift and be the church. So what's our next steps? Pretty simple. What's one way that you've been moved to join Jesus on his mission of setting people free today? It's already there. You just haven't given the opportunity to be a part of it yet. Whether that's um, serving people, uh, whether that's having relationships uh, in your neighborhood, what is it? And then, of course, the next step, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? I can't tell you what to do. I can't tell you how to process it. Only you can do it. And frankly, I don't want to. I don't want to tell you what you should be doing. I want you to sit and pray and fast and lament and walk through whatever you need to walk through to figure it out. Because we're in a battle. We're in a war here. And the devil's not going to let up for a second. So once he gets into your head, if you don't deal with it, Man, he's going to keep pushing and oppressing and oppressing and oppressing. Stand up and fight. Use your gift, believer. Use it and help set people free. So let's take a moment here. Let's close our eyes. Let's settle our spirits for just a second. And I just want to pray over everybody here. Here's a, a prayer thought for us. God, please reveal to us now in this moment in the name of Jesus how you would have us join you in setting people free. Please speak to us even now. So God, whatever you're doing, however you're working, however you're communicating, I thank you for the way that you just thank you for the way that you're always pursuing us, drawing us to yourself. And so please give us courage now to move forward, to do, be stronger, anoint us in the name of Jesus to honor you. It's in his name. All God's people say, amen. All right. Hey, let's stand together, receive the blessing of the Lord as we head out here today. Don't forget, next Sunday, June 13th, we're going to have a front yard service. Everybody's going to be outside, all ages, all of us together. Bring chairs, bring blankets, 
bring fidgets, I don't even care. Bring it, sit on the front lawn at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. If it becomes a torrential downpour, we'll figure it out. But show up, man, and we will gather together as the church of Jesus Christ. Now, receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Say it with me. Now go and be the church.